have the honor to present to you the moral leader of our nation. I have the pleasure to present to you Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. I am happy to join with you today in what will go down in history as the greatest demonstration for freedom in the history of our nation. Five score years ago, a great American in whose symbolic shadow we stand today signed the Emancipation Proclamation. And this momentous decree came as a great beacon light of hope to millions of Negro slaves who had been seared in the flames of withering injustice. It came as a joyous daybreak to end the long night of their captivity. But 100 years later, the Negro still is not free. 100 years later, the, the life of the Negro is still sadly crippled by the manacles of segregation and the chains of discrimination. One hundred years later, the Negro lives on a lonely island of poverty in the midst of a vast ocean of material prosperity. One hundred years later, The, the Negro is still languished in the corners of American society and finds himself in exile in his own land. And so we've come here today to dramatize the shameful condition. In a sense, we've come to our nation's capital to cash a check. And the architects of our republic wrote the magnificent words of the Constitution and the Declaration of Independence. They were signing a promissory note to which every American was to fall heir. This note was a promise that all men, yes, black men as well as white men, would be guaranteed the unalienable rights of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. It is obvious today that America has defaulted on this promissory note insofar as her citizens of color are concerned. Instead of honoring this sacred obligation, America has given the Negro people a bad check. Check which has come back marked insufficient funds. But we refuse to believe that the Bank of Justice is bankrupt. We refuse to believe that there are insufficient funds in the great vaults of opportunity of this nation. So we've come to cash this check, a check that will give us upon demand the riches of freedom and the security of justice. We have also come to this hallowed spot to remind America of the fierce urgency of now. This is no time to engage in the luxury of cooling off or to take the tranquilizing drug of gradualism. Now is the time 
to make real the promises of democracy. Now is the time to rise from the dark and desolate valley of segregation to the sunlit path of racial justice. Now is the time <laughs> to lift our nation from the quicksands of racial injustice to the solid rock of brotherhood. Now is the time <laughs> to make justice a reality for all of God's children. It would be fatal for the nation to overlook the urgency of the moment. This sweltering summer of the Negro's legitimate discontent will not pass until that is an invigorating all. 1963 is not an end, but a beginning. Those who hope that the Negro needed to blow off steam and will now be content We'll have a rude awakening if the nation returns to business as usual. And there will be neither rest nor tranquility in America until the Negro is granted his citizenship rights. The whirlwinds of revolt will continue to shake the foundations of our nation until the bright day of justice emerges. But that is something that I must say to my people who stand on the warm threshold which leads into the palace of justice in the process of gaining our rightful place. We must not be guilty of wrongful deeds. Let us not seek to satisfy our thirst for freedom by drinking from the cup of bitterness and hatred. We must forever conduct our struggle on the high plane of dignity and discipline. We must not allow our creative protests to degenerate into physical violence. Again and again, we must rise to the majestic heights of meeting physical force with soul force. And the marvelous new militancy which has engulfed the Negro community must not lead us to a distrust of all white people. For many of our white brothers, as evidenced by their presence here today, have come to realize that their destiny is tied up with our destiny. They have come to realize that their freedom is inextricably bound to our freedom. We cannot walk alone. And as we walk, we must make the pledge that we shall always march ahead. We cannot turn back. There are those who are asking the devotees of civil rights, when will you be satisfied? We can never be satisfied as long as the Negro is the victim of the unspeakable horrors of police brutality. We can never be satisfied. As long as our body is heavy with the fatigue of travel, cannot gain lodging in the motels of the highways and the hotels of the cities. We cannot be satisfied as long as the Negro's basic mobility is from a smaller ghetto to a larger one. We can never be satisfied as long as our children are stripped of their selfhood and robbed of their dignity by signs stating for whites only. We cannot be satisfied as long as a Negro in Mississippi cannot vote and a Negro in New York believes he has nothing for which to vote. No, no, we are not satisfied and we will not be satisfied until justice rolls down like waters and righteousness like a mighty stream. I am 
I'm not my unmindful that some of you have come here out of great trials and tribulations. Some of you have come fresh from narrow jail cells. And some of you have come from areas where your quest for freedom left you battered by the storms of persecution and staggered by the winds of police brutality. You have been the veterans of creative suffering. Continue to work with the faith that unearned suffering is redemptive. Go back to Mississippi. Go back to Alabama. Go back to South Carolina. Go back to Georgia. Go back to Louisiana. Go back to the slums and ghettos of our northern cities. Knowing that somehow this situation can and will be changed. Let us not wallow in the valley of despair. I say to you today, my friend, so even though we face the difficulties of today and tomorrow, I still have a dream. It is a dream deeply rooted in the American dream. I have a dream that one day this nation will rise up and live out the true meaning of its creed. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. I have a dream that one day on the red hills of Georgia, the sons of former slaves and the sons of former slave owners will they be able to sit down together at the table of brotherhood. I have a dream that one day even the state of Mississippi, a state sweltering with the heat of injustice, sweltering with the heat of oppression will be transformed into an oasis of freedom and justice. I have a dream that my four little children will one day live in a nation where they will not be judged by the color of their skin but by the content of their character. I have a dream today. I have a dream that one day down in Alabama with its vicious racist, with its governor having his lips dripping with the words of interposition and nullification, one day right there in Alabama little black boys and black girls will be able to join hands with little white boys and white girls as sisters and brothers. I have a dream today. I have a dream that one day every valley shall be exalted. And every hill and mountain shall be made low. The rough places will be made plain. And the crooked places will be made straight. And the glory of the Lord shall be revealed. And all flesh shall see it together. This is our hope. This is the faith that I go back to the south with. With this faith. We will be able to hew out of the mountain of despair a stone of hope. With this faith, we will be able to transform the jangling discords of our nation into a beautiful symphony of brotherhood. With this faith, we will be able to work together, to pray together, to struggle together, to go to jail together, to stand up for freedom together, knowing that we will be free one day. This will be the day, this will be the day with all of God's children be able to sing with new meaning, my country tears of thee. Sweet land of liberty of thee I sing. Land where my fathers died, land of the pilgrim's pride. From every mountainside, 
let freedom ring, and if America is to be a great nation, this must become true. And so let freedom ring from the prodigious hilltops of New Hampshire. Let freedom ring from the mighty mountains of New York. Let freedom ring from the heightening Alleghenies of Pennsylvania. Let freedom ring from the snow-capped Rockies of Colorado. Let freedom ring from the curvaceous slopes of California. But not only that, let freedom ring from Stone Mountain of Georgia. Let freedom ring from Lookout Mountain of Tennessee. Let freedom ring from every hill and mole hill of Mississippi, from every mountainside. Let freedom ring, and when this happens, and when we allow freedom ring, when we let it ring from every village and every hamlet, from every state and every city, we will be able to speed up that day when all of God's children, black men and white men, Jews and Gentiles, Protestants and Catholics, will be able to join hands and sing in the words of the old Negro spiritual, free at last, free at last, thank God Almighty, we are free at last. All right, welcome to my first video on the Martin Luther King assassination. We're going to call this MLK number one. Um, it is 22 August, and um, I'm starting off from the beginning here. Um, this video series is going to be exploring the Martin Luther King assassination of which I don't think there's ever been any kind of um, detailed investigation of that or video or any any kind of series or anything like that so I'm gonna do that I grew up in Atlanta I grew up in the shadow of the assassination of Martin Luther King I was born in 1966 Martin Luther King was assassinated two years later although I was only two years old the legacy of Martin Luther King and the assassination reverberated through all of Atlanta Atlanta was ahead of the, the rest of the south this is one reason why it did economically so much better not that it was perfect not that it was completely free but it was ahead because of the physical spiritual moral force of Martin Luther King we're gonna go into what Martin Luther King was doing the forces that opposed him and the civil rights against the civil rights movement um, their reasonings for possibly wanting to assassinate him, and there were many, and the possible suspects besides James Earl Ray. Now, in this video, I'm not going to say that James Earl Ray was innocent, but from my research, which I'll be presenting here, it's pretty damn obvious there were other forces involved behind the assassination. So, like I've done in my other JFK videos and the Atlanta child murders, I'm going to be reading over documents, FBI documents, autopsy reports, all, all kinds of things. We're going to kind of break it down between FBI documents, YouTube videos. Um, there's a really great site called Mary Feller. She's got a lot of good articles, uh, news articles, books, and Wikipedia articles. So... Eventually we can get into all that. We're going to go over the evidence. It's going to be a slow learning process. This is not going to be, this is my theory and this is my evidence to back it up. This is going to be a learning process for me. Again, I, I don't know who killed Martin Luther King. Apparently, James Earl Ray had something to do with it, but not all of it. 
But anyway, we'll get into that, and uh, we'll just keep going and pushing forward. All we say to America is be true to what you said on paper. If I lived in China or even Russia or any totalitarian country, maybe I could understand some of these illegal injunctions. Maybe I could understand the denial of certain basic First Amendment privileges because they have committed themselves to that over there. But somewhere I read of the freedom of assembly. Somewhere I read of the freedom of speech. Somewhere I read of the freedom of press. Somewhere I read that the greatness of America is the right to protest far right. So just as I say we aren't going to let any dogs or water hoses turn us around, we aren't going to let any injunction turn us around. Well, I don't know what will happen now. We've got some difficult days ahead. But it really doesn't matter with me now because I've been to the mountaintop. Like anybody, I would like to live a long life. Longevity has its place. But I'm not concerned about that now. I just want to do God's will. And he's allowed me to go up to the mountain. And I've looked over. And I've seen the promised land. I may not get there with you, but I want you to know the night that we as a people will get to the promised land. So I'm happy tonight. I'm not worried about anything. I'm not fearing any man. Mine eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. This is a CBS News special report. Dan Rather reporting for CBS News from New York. The Reverend Martin Luther King Jr. was shot to death by an assassin late today as he stood on a balcony in Memphis, Tennessee. Dr. King had planned to lead another civil rights march in Memphis next Monday. We got the latest on the story now from Russ Hodge, News Director of WRBC. Cold days ahead. of Martin Luther King was light years beyond the understanding of any normal human being. To be able to sacrifice your life and your body for the freedom of your fellow man is almost messianic in its action. Martin Luther King was an incredible force for good an incredible moral force 
and who, despite everything, despite the beatings, despite the death threats, despite being locked in jail, the racist taunts, still believed in America. I mean, how do you do that? How do you get to that point after all you've been through? Most people would have thrown up their hands and say, God damn, fuck America. All that we've been through, it could be understandable for someone to do that. But Martin Luther King believed in America. He believed in the Constitution written by a bunch of rich white guys for rich white guys. The great strategy, I believe, of Martin Luther King was to take white America's own words in the Constitution, in the Bill of Rights, in the Declaration of Independence, and throw it back in their face with more indignation to turn this white society that saw itself as perfect and great and to expose it for what it really was racist violent liars and not living up to what its words were, you know, saying one thing and practicing another. That is what made him great. Because most people could have just gotten angry, gone out and fought to take it back. But he fought in a different way. Peaceful. But he put shame back on America to fulfill its own words and promises and turned it around and made them see that oh shit all these fancy words about freedom and justice that we endure or not endear so much oh well oh we didn't write that in there because we're trying to feel good about ourselves but we meant that only for white people And Martin Luther King reminded them there was no exception clause in the Independence Declaration of Independence, the Bill of Rights, the Constitution. All men were created equal. Even though at the time we wrote these instruments, we were enslaving people. The person who wrote the Declaration of Independence and the Bill of Rights, Jefferson and Madison, were all slave owners who beat their slaves daily, but yet they talked about enlightenment, freedom, justice. These were hollow words. And it took a civil war to bring those home, and still after the civil war, there still wasn't complete freedom and justice. And it took another hundred years and we're still fighting to this day for it. But no one, no one will ever have the moral high ground that Martin Luther King had. And because of that, they couldn't kill him. He was a leading moral force in the United States the Johnson administration, after Kennedy was killed, tried to corral, control the civil rights movement and use it to gain votes. But they couldn't control that either. And then when Johnson went into Vietnam and started bombing the hell out of Vietnam, Martin Luther King turned on him and said, you know, what you're doing to black people in America, you're bombing 
in killing yellow people in Vietnam. And he gives a lot of good speeches about the moral indignity of Vietnam. Also, it was a civil rights issue because the people being drafted were people that couldn't go to college. There was an exception for people that went to college. So that meant that out of a population that was 10% of the American population, 20 to 25%, one out of four of American soldiers, and it was actually more, I think it was one out of three of American soldiers in Vietnam, were African Americans. And he saw the injustice of that, not only of America bombing the shit out of yellow people in Asia, but sending African Americans to fight for freedom in a land that we shouldn't even have been in when they had no freedom or had not the same rights in America. And that turned him against the war, which gave him no access anymore to the Johnson administration. The power establishment saw Martin Luther King as a threat because of his stance on the Vietnam War and his continued stance pushing for civil rights. And there were already racists and Nazis long ago and segregationists against you know, Martin Luther King, long before 68, but in 68, well, 67, when he turned against the Vietnam War, that put him up against the power establishment who were making money, building bombers and helicopters, and fighting this endless war in Vietnam, when we should never have been there. So that was the final straw. Martin Luther King went to Memphis for a sanitation workers' strike. African American sanitation workers went on strike because they weren't receiving the same pay, matter of fact, much less pay than their white counterparts. So he went there to support them. The FBI, the military intelligence had been monitoring him the FBI had been threatening him and threatening other civil rights leaders and even encouraging him, you know, saying he should commit suicide and saying he was involved with other women and things like that through their counter intel pro. You can see in the video the body language of Martin Luther King. He, he, he knows something's going to happen to him. Eventually, they're going to get him. The threats, the phone calls, all these things. He knows the walls are closing in, and this is why he gives this speech. When he talks about going to the mountaintop, you can see in his body language, his eyes are flickering. But he still goes out there and faces death in the eyes. Most men would have ran. Most men would have hood, hid. But he went out and put himself and his body on the line for freedom. And we need to just explore why and who those people were that saw him so much as a threat that they had to kill him. And we're going we're gonna to go through all that. Danny, what a view we have right now. We are standing atop Mount Nebo. This was part of the Holy Land, 
Uh, but we're not in the land that you and I are usually in, the land of Israel. We are in Jordan right now. The Hashemite Kingdom of Jordan. Uh, in biblical times, this is presumably the very place where Moses saw the promised land, or most of it. But the Jordan River will be an obstacle he will not overcome. He will die before crossing over the Jordan River, will be buried somewhere on Mount Nebo. The Bible says that it doesn't know its exact location. And Joshua will take over. Wow. Joshua will make sure everyone is circumcised. And then they will cross over, will battle the city of Jericho. You can see it yeah. vaguely there on the other side of the valley. And will eventually take and settle in the promised land. Now, Danny, set the scene for us a bit more. Number one, again, an absolutely breathtaking view. Uh, God doesn't make mistakes. You can see why he brought Moses here to this vantage point to show him the promised land. Uh, set the scene. Okay, we're here on Mount Nebo in Jordan. Uh, but as you mentioned, Jericho, what else can we see over the horizon on a clear day here in Jordan? First of all, at the lowest part of this valley, the Jordan meanders its way into the Dead Sea, right under the sun. Right. On a clear day, you can see uh, the towers over Mount Scopus and Mount of Olives. So you can see Jerusalem from here yes, on a clear day. Yes, you can see the holy city of Jerusalem also from here quite well. Bethlehem, you can see. Okay, Bethlehem. and the Judean desert, the Samaria, Eastern mountains. Uh, they're all very visible from here. The yeah. land of milk and honey is just yes, around the here. corner. And it was so close to Moses, he could almost touch it. Yet he was not permitted, the Bible says, to enter the land, Danny. Now, some believe Moses was actually buried, Danny, in the valley below us, yes. if I'm not mistaken, right? The text is a bit vague. It mentions a mountaintop and then it mentions a valley. And it concludes with the statement that the tomb location is really just unknown uh, and maybe that's done deliberate because uh, in Judaism the desire is to worship only God and only in one place up in Jerusalem the tomb of Moses should not be any focal point of veneration right. so right. the text says its location is unknown Joshua now takes over they will cross over the Jordan River the Israelites cross over where they will inherit the promised land now centuries later in the same area John the Baptist will start preaching for the end of days that are coming soon and will start baptizing people in the water of the Jordan River. Tradition says it also happened here. In fact, tradition says it... On the it, Jordanian side. Yes, it says on, on Bethany beyond the Jordan, but in the same location, argues the tradition, where Joshua crossed over. Wow. The site becomes holy for both events and even... All right, so as a Jew, the reason I mention this is because Martin Luther King is talking about um, he's seen the promised land. He's been to the mountaintop. And it's an eerie foreshadowing of his death, whether he knows he's being threatened or he knows he has a good idea that they're eventually going to get me. Um, or it's just, you know, coincidence. But it's very foreseeing for the what happens to him. He's up on the balcony of the Lorraine Hotel. He's looking out to his flock and then he's just he's taken down he's assassinated shot in the head very similar so Moses was punished by God for disobeying God and siding with the children of Israel who were complaining all the time and Moses God in the Sinai um, God had cursed Moses and says because of your transgressions this generation that complains won't see the promised land and neither shall you so Moses knew that he would never enter the promised land yet he still continued to lead the next generation all the way up to the Jordan River and so this is what Martin Luther King is is foreshadowing about he may be leading this and I may not get to the promised land you uh, land with you but we as a people shall get to the promised land so this is what he's talking about he's it's very I don't know how you can get up there and say that speech and then walk out on that balcony the next day is very I couldn't done I couldn't have done it I would have hid I would have ran anyway just very, very interesting. That's what he's talking about, if you've ever wondered about that. 
The Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King, 39 years old and a Nobel Peace Prize winner, and the leader of the nonviolent civil rights movement in the United States was assassinated in Memphis tonight. A sniper's bullet cut down Dr. King as he stood on a hotel balcony in Memphis. Within an hour, Dr. King was dead. That happened at 7 p.m. Eastern Time. The nation was shocked. President Johnson expressed horror and then postponed his trip to Hawaii until tomorrow. We're going to go to Memphis now and talk to ABC's Tom Gerrall, who is on the scene. Here in Memphis, of course, a great deal of shock, a great deal of confusion, and a great deal of uh, uh, some violence. I can't say a great deal because I don't really know. I do know that uh, police are very concerned that the fire department are, is moving uh, units around the streets and that uh, there is some rock throwing and some fires reported and some shooting at a full extent of, at, at this time from this vantage point can't be uh, assessed. Uh, the full curfew has been imposed on the streets of Memphis. Everyone except emergency vehicles uh, are being cleared from the streets. The National Guard, which had been on duty here uh, up until late last night, they have been recalled to duty and uh, are being put on the streets of Memphis right away. Of course, a great deal of confusion and chaos uh, resulting from the announcement here that Dr. King had died. It was a very great shock for something like this to happen. The uh, shooting occurred at the Lorraine Motel. It was a favorite place for civil rights leaders and for Negro businessmen to stay uh, here in Memphis. I believe we have some film now, Bob, if we can take a look at that. This is where the shooting occurred tonight, where Dr. King was killed. The Lorraine Motel is a favorite place for Negro leaders to stay while in Memphis. It's a very nice new modern motel. He was on the second floor balcony, out, standing exactly where these two officers are, talking with some of his aides at the time of the shooting. The uh, scene immediately became confused. Officers ran forward and, and uh, attempted to secure the area. The shot apparently came from an apartment building directly across the street. The uh, members of Dr. King's staff were there discussing a mass rally which was planned for tonight. They said that uh, suddenly there was a sound that sounded faintly like a firecracker or something and, and uh, he was talking about then he was the shot. Musical program for tonight's uh, mass rally? Yeah, yeah. And he had asked you to play a special tune? Yes, yeah. Uh -huh. Did he say anything after he was shot? Could you tell how seriously he was wounded? He just said, oh, and it knocked him back, you know, off his feet. After that, was anything said at all? Nothing but all, oh, and uh, we, we all, and Reverend Jackson, he yelled back at Dr. King. You know. We all hollered, everybody hollered, after the shooting, you know. I was standing kind of sideways. I really didn't have my back to the where the shot came from. And when I turned all around, we saw the sheriff or the police up on the hill up there. That was the uh, musical director for Dr. King's group, Ben Branch. He was standing alongside Dr. King uh, when the shot came that, that killed uh, Dr. King. In fact, Dr. King was discussing tonight's musical program with Ben Branch at the very moment when the shot was fired. The shot, as I say, apparently came from a, an apartment building which uh, had a number of floors and overlooked the motel. It was a very clear shot uh, to the place where Dr. King was standing on the balcony discussing the situation uh, with his aides. Uh, the police here in Memphis immediately issued a bulletin for a young white man dressed in dark clothes who dashed out of that building across the street. Uh, he dropped a Browning automatic rifle which was fitted with a scope on the sidewalk and then he fled. Uh, we don't have any late information from police headquarters here in Memphis because uh, communications channels at the moment are completely clogged with emergency calls. We don't know if anyone has been apprehended, although we understand that some suspects may be being questioned uh, at police headquarters. So the situation here in Memphis uh, is that a complete shock. Uh, the community is in a uh, state of confusion at the moment. Uh, telephone lines, except for emergency calls, uh, are not being handled. Emergency calls only are being handled. And the uh, curfew, which uh, has been reimposed as a full curfew, everyone off the streets except emergency vehicles, and the National Guard has been called back out uh, in an effort to maintain law and order. This is Tom Gerald in Memphis. Now back to Bob Young in New York.
Thank you, Tom. Joining me here in New York is Peter Jennings, who's uh, been on the road around the country, has seen uh, some of the civil rights uh, happenings, and uh, has met Dr. King, and as I have. Um, Peter, do you have any uh, immediate thoughts about what this assassination, uh, what the reactions may be around the country to it? I know this is highly speculative, but it's... Yeah, I, I, I suppose the first concern, Bob, that everybody has, and it's obviously the one that Governor Buford Ellington has, and the people of Memphis have, and the people of Harlem have, and other major Negro areas in the cities around the country, is the, is the outbreak of violence. I was sitting with a friend of mine tonight um, who's been very involved in thinking and uh, believing in civil rights, and asked what his reaction was, and... Uh, would there be violence? And he said no, he didn't think so, that uh, King had created such a spirit, uh, that this would not create a mass kind of violence like Malcolm X did. I think it uh, bodes some waiting, and fortunately in New York's Harlem, it's raining tonight. Weather has a great deal to do with violence, as I'm sure that both you and I know, yeah. both, uh, both in this country as indeed it does in some of the Latin countries, which where we have both served. Yeah, there's a great, there's, Bob, there's a great radio station uh, in New York here, uh, WBAI are the call letters, I think, which is a, essentially a Harlem-oriented radio station. And on past occasions when things have got, you know, touchy in that particular area, WBAI has done a great deal to keep the community knit together and calm down. I was trying to get them on the radio tonight and uh, find out if they were keeping things cool. Good evening. So... That's the news uh, that came out right there. I find it interesting, especially at the very end there, they're they're not so much concerned about the killer and what exactly happened, more details on that, but they do seem to be, you can see them fidgeting around also, that as white guys, they seem to be more concerned about black violence from the inner city which I find kind of disheartening um, and kind of odd uh, that that would be your first concerns I mean you know everybody is concerned about violence from the inner city and from African Americans and I mean what else you know like that they expect that's going to be the the first reaction okay um, and there were, there was violence, of course, but what else would you expect? Because people are angry, you know, that a man of peace and justice would be gunned down. Um, but they seem to be so concerned about, let, you know, let's keep the, the violence, the, these people under control, you know. Quite disturbing to me. Um... One thing about 1968, quite a volatile year. Of course, that's when all, you know, after the summer of love of 1967. And 1968 was a very violent year. Uh, the beginning in February was the Tet Offensive. You know, Johnson had basically been saying that they were winning the war. Westmoreland was out there saying, who's the general in Vietnam, was saying they were winning the war. The you know, the light is right around the, the the end is right around the corner, and then all of a sudden this massive Tet Offensive breaks out all over the country in South Vietnam, in every city, every hamlet, the U.S. embassies overrun, uh, bombs are blown up, uh, air bases are overrun, military bases are overrun. The U.S. wins and decisively defeats the Viet Cong, but they lose the moral high ground. Here they've been telling people for years that Johnson and them, that we're winning the war, the end's right around the corner, just hang on a few more months, and here's the Viet Cong launching this massive offensive that it's like they weren't even injured, you know. And from that, that was the end. And... Now, I can't remember if the sequence goes that Martin Luther King gets killed and then Johnson resigns. Hold on one second. So, yeah, it's very, very odd that on March 31st, about four days before uh, Martin Luther King is assassinated, LBJ, because of what's happening in Vietnam and all these other things, decides that he's not going to run again and won't accept the nomination of his party 
for president. He had worked all his life to become president, some would say even killing Kennedy, and then because of what's the setbacks in Vietnam, because of uh, people like Martin Luther King turning on him, there was a lot of pressure on him. Um, you know, and then the rumors are coming out that uh, RFK is going to run for president. And so Johnson decides not to run only four days before Martin Luther King is killed. And that, to me, what that says is that he's already planned the people, the military staff, the rogue elements. Okay, when I say military, when I say intelligence operatives, um, police officials, right-wing racists, I'm talking about rogue elements of the government, the same rogue elements that killed Kennedy. There wasn't like some vast CIA or military conspiracy to kill Kennedy or to kill uh, Martin Luther King. There were rogue right-wing elements involved in that. I think also, this is my opinion, that LBJ gave the nod for them to kill Kennedy because he knew he would inherit the uh, presidency but then after the Kennedy and after the Vietnam setbacks and after all these things, he just decides, you know, I'm too old for this shit and decides to bow out. And, you know, probably a sense of guilt, too, of being part. So the same establishment that went after and killed Kennedy is now part of the same establishment that's trying to eliminate Martin Luther King, who... As long as he stuck to civil rights, they didn't have that much of a problem. Now, the racist uh, rednecks and Southerners and Nazis had a problem, but they weren't a major part of the force, the establishment, the military-industrial complex. But once, you know, once MLK came out against the Vietnam War, that kind of basically just signed his, his, his death sentence right there. And one could think that maybe even LBJ knew that this was in the works coming and decided to bow out as president just four days before um, MLK is, is assassinated. That maybe someone told him that, hey, Martin Luther King can't live another day because he's disrupting our war efforts, he's disrupting our profits, he's disrupting our stability so he needs to be eliminated and once LBJ heard that that's my opinion no evidence to back it up it's just coincidence is it just coincidence that four five days four, four day, five days before MLK is assassinated that Johnson resigns and then just two months later Robert Kennedy the brother of JFK who had been killed who was coming out against the Vietnam War also and most likely as president would have established another commission to investigate his brother's death and dug up a lot of skeletons is it just coincidence that two months later he's assassinated so I'm going to do a whole thing about RFK also but just too many fucking coincidences, I think. Martin Luther King was a major political and moral force in the country, and that's why I believe, and, he, and then he came out against Vietnam, and that's why I believe they eliminated him. All right, so now for some geography. Now, this is the uh, Google Maps God's Eye view of the Lorraine Hotel, which is right here. Uh, they built onto this the um, National Civil Rights Museum and approximately about here was where um, Martin Luther King was standing on the balcony and then he was shot I believe either from this hotel room or from a hotel room that was here I believe it was this one and They've gone in, there was another building here, they've gone in and removed this building so they could have this little plaza. Now, so basically, supposedly James Earl Ray was in a 
a rented room here. He shot Martin Luther King one time, ran outside, dropped his bag in front of a, a restaurant right here, ran down, jumped in his white Mustang, drove off. Interestingly, he drove all the way from Memphis all the way down to Atlanta, where Martin Luther King was from, and left his white Mustang there, got on a plane, flew to Canada. He was gone many, many months. He had picked up a uh, passport in the name of a guy named Godot, Godot um, who actually turned out to be a former Rhodesian soldier who had worked with the CIA. And um, it's very interesting that this is like in Montreal, I believe, and then eventually he was caught in a, um, a London Heathrow airport trying to get on a plane to Spain or Portugal, I believe, with connecting flights to Rhodesia. So I find that interesting that he's using this former Rhodesian Canadian passport and then trying to get back into Rhodesia, which was a, you know, white um, minority run government like South Africa used to be. Um, another interesting story is that there used to be a set of bushes here. There, now there's trees. This is what I've, I've read over the years. That there was a set of bushes here. And that some people saw the shot yeah, here's the Lorraine Hotel, so it would have been about right here is that little corner. Saw the shot come from behind the fire station and in these little bushes here and that someone was seen fleeing going this way shortly after Martin Luther King was killed. Um, hold on one second. There's two other things here that people had seen and there are reports of military men on top of the fire station here. Uh, men dressed in fatigues and carrying radios and we're going to read over some documents showing that military intelligence was monitoring Martin Luther King and his movements all over the country. And they were reporting back to so the, any kind of military base nearby, they would send a military intelligence unit out to wherever Martin Luther King was at and was monitoring him. Now, we already know the FBI was monitoring him and following him around. Um, but now, this is the military establishment. So, which makes sense if you're directing the war in Vietnam, you've got someone who's against the war in Vietnam, a very powerful moral force that could lead thousands of people. I, I guess the fear basically was with over one out of three, 30% of the recruits coming from the African American population, one of the fears was that if Martin Luther King had called a boycott for on black draftees to resist the draft against the war, it would have seriously depleted the manpower. It was already having problems already, but if you lose 30% of your force, because Martin Luther King was that kind of force, if he had gotten up and made a speech against the Vietnam War and said no African American men should be drafted, should, should submit to the draft, it could have seriously hurt the military efforts in Vietnam, that's a good reason for them to be, for in their mind, to be monitoring him. Now, there was a story, we're probably going to come across it somehow, that there was a African-American uh, fireman, I believe, fire chief, who was in this station. And the day before Martin Luther King got there, he was told he was transferred to another station. So the only white firemen 
we're in that location. Another story is that there were um, there was a guy who was a volunteer for was it SNCC I believe or coordinator with SNCC uh, which was some another younger civil rights organization and he was actually the leader there in Tennessee I believe or one of the leaders and he actually was an undercover Memphis policeman and I believe that same guy okay was the guy who was the one of the first people to come to Martin Luther King's aid and check to see if he was alive or not we're gonna come across a video I'm sure of that he was actually busted uh, there were some people in Memphis I believe he was hired by the FBI to go undercover in the in this civil rights organization but there were people in Memphis that knew him that he was a policeman people in the African American community and when he went in one day to some store people started talking and saying hey we know you, you used to be a policeman now you're involved in the civil rights organization wow that's interesting and they got a visit the very next day from the FBI telling them basically to forget the whole thing or they'd be really sorry so there were a lot of shenanigans going on whether all these people the Memphis police the Memphis fire department the FBI military intelligence whether all these groups were involved in the assassination I don't know yet but apparently all of them knew something was going to happen so these are just the things I can recall right off the top of my head alright so now let's get on to street view Alright, so if this is the same buildings and it's not a building that was removed here, one of these buildings, the rooming house, was in the back there. And James Earl Jones says he came down to one of these little alcoves, either that one, and I'm not exactly sure, but we will find out, or this one, or maybe even this one and he dropped the bag and he said that he was told to drop the bag by this guy uh, Raul I believe that was his contact this is a story that he says later and the thing about we're gonna get into James Earl Ray but the thing that's really interesting about James Earl Ray is that he was just a petty criminal he had escaped from prison for petty theft and he had lived in Mexico, Tijuana for a while, and he was involved in the pornography trade. Um, he would film prostitutes and things like that. He was selling those, and he made enough money from that to get plastic surgery. Okay, and then, uh, and he also made enough money from that to buy this white car. Um, then he makes he says this story about he had met up with Raúl in this bar in Montreal okay and that Raul had given him several different passports and that's when he gave him this assignment to kill MLK we're gonna get into more of the details on this um, or no not to but not to kill MLK he didn't even know exactly if MLK was coming to Memphis but he was told to drop this bag at a certain time and a certain date in front of one of these doorways and said that he was never in the room he, he had rented the room but didn't know MLK was staying at the hotel there 
and that he was told to bring down this bag at a certain time, drop it, check out of the hotel, bring down the bag and drop it in front of the hotel. And then he got in his white station wagon, or no, white um, Mustang, drove off, and he said he had seen and heard police cars and sirens while he was leaving Memphis on his way back to Atlanta, and it was on the radio that he heard that Martin Luther King had been shot and that he started hearing the news reports that they were looking for him, okay? So he fled the country, went up to Montreal for a while, um, got this passport from this Rhodesian, or took on the name of this Rhodesian CIA operative that was operating out of Montreal and went to Europe. It's my understanding that he went back and forth a couple of times or he was finally caught at Gat- at Gatwick, okay, um, at London on his way to Portugal and then South Africa, or Rhodesia. We'll get into all that uh, in much more detail. But basically, he's saying he was a patsy. He was set up by this mysterious guy named Raul, who was a gun runner or something like that, um, and he would do jobs for him take a package here across the border into Mexico across the border into Canada across from Canada into Mexico he knew some of these packages were weapons so he knew he was smuggling guns into Canada or into Mexico interestingly the in the JFK assassination uh, David Ferry was constantly flying um this guy named um, hold on one second Clay Shaw to Montreal and that Clay Shaw spoke perfect French and was constantly going up to have meetings with certain people who've been described as people involved in French intelligence in Montreal so, of course, there's a connection there. Of course, a lot of French people, Creole in, in New Orleans. So there's a connection there. Also, New Orleans is just right down the road, right down the river uh, from Memphis. So it's not quite far away. Um, there's supposedly some kind, because Tennessee doesn't have an income tax, supposedly a lot of mobsters run uh, what do you call them shadow companies shell companies out of Memphis and this is what, what about that uh, movie that came out called uh, The Pelican Brief I believe uh, was kind of with Tom Cruise was kind of related about that how the mobsters had their own law firm that helped cover their ass and set up these shell companies for them but of course And also, you know, Elvis lived in Memphis also. (laughs) But anyway, that's that's what I have so far. We're going to continue along this line. I'm going to go over Wikipedia documents. We're going to go over FBI documents, YouTube videos, um, news articles. I'm going to read from books. And we're also going to go over articles about the assassination from the House Assassinations Committee. And... You know, the parallels and connections between the MLK, the RFK, and the JFK assassinations are just astounding. Kind of the same group of people, the military industrial complex, racist, right wing, um, rogue elements of the CIA, the military, uh, the mob, and the, uh, the Klan. And you, we're either going to find some Cubans involved in this also. And they all show up in the JFK assassination, the RFK assassination, the MLK assassination, and then they re-pop back up in the Watergate scandal. All right, so we'll keep working on this and slowly go through these documents and see what we can find. Again, I'm not saying that James Earl Ray is completely innocent, but I believe there are definitely other players involved in this whole situation just like 
in my Atlanta child murders videos, I don't think that Wayne Williams is completely innocent, but there were definitely some other players involved in that. Something else going on. There's always, one thing I found out in 57 years is there's always, always, always much more to a story than, than meets the eye. You can always go down a rabbit hole a lot deeper than just scratching the surface and there, you'll be surprised what you find. All right, take care. And again, I'm going to do one of these videos not very often, about every, I've got so much stuff to work on, probably once every two weeks um, because I've got all these other things I'm working on. And also got to work and pay the bills. <laughs> but it's a lot of it's a lot of fun. I don't mean to degrade the MLK or the assassination, but you know, like I've said in my other videos, that if you enjoy doing something and you're actually accomplishing some kind of good, stay at it. It's what you know. Getting up in the morning, people don't get up to go. Oh boy, let me go work 12 hours today seven days a week so I can pay the mortgage and I can pay the gas bill and the electric bill. That's not why we live. That's not what makes us, gives us energy to live and get up in the morning. It's these kinds of things. Seeking justice, seeking righteousness, working for good. These are the things that really let us know we're alive and help us to get up in the morning because if not if it's just another day of paying of giving someone else two thousand three thousand dollars so you can live and not be homeless what's the point in that I mean yeah not being homeless and being in a house is pretty cool but there's not a lot of thrill in that I don't know of anyone I don't know of anyone that tells me, oh, I can't wait to go to work tomorrow and work 12 hours so I can pay my mortgage at the end of the month. Oh, joy. Nobody. So if you find something you like, you're good at it, and you learn something from it, and you're doing something for justice and righteousness, which is what I'm all about, it, you can never get enough of it. I'll probably be doing this to the day I kill over and die at my computer at the ripe old age of 80 or 90 years old. I'll be, yeah, we're still working on the Martin Luther King assassination in 2050 or whatever. And then, boom, you'll hear, you know, you'll hear boom, as my head hits the, the desk at 90, 95 years old. But I'll at least die doing something I want to do instead of dying over stress Oh, God, I got to go pay that mortgage. I can only eat dog food this week because I got to pay that fucking mortgage or the rent or whatever. Anyway, take care, and we'll see you next time. And if you got any comments, please make them. All right, take care.